Hi, Bon, everybody. Uh, I think we're we have a full house, so we might as well start, although we were supposed to start a little later. Uh, I have a present task to introduce somebody whom all of you know. So it's a silly thing to do, but I guess formality is such that uh, I have to do that. Uh, I don't know whether most of you know that Gehan and Jetwing go a long way. Uh, he was the one who uh, initially introduced us to kind of, you know, eco and uh, the wildlife part. He's the one who started the eco holidays, Jetwing eco holidays. And he's been with us for almost 10 years, right? And uh, until he wanted to give up the binos and the leech socks and went back to London to do his uh, corporate banking. I'm sure Nirma had a lot to do with it, but that's the way life goes. Uh, but uh, so while he was at Jetwing, he did a lot, as I said, with the elephant gathering, the uh, leopard uh, at Yala, uh, the bird ringing, so many things that, that he's done. And uh, I think it, somebody had said that uh, not, no single individual has done what Gehan has done for a country's branding uh, as, a, as a wildlife destination, uh, even with the whales. And there was a lot of controversy as to who it was that started it. And I think uh, Anoma from uh, Jetwing Lighthouse was the, really the person who initially started spotting these whales. And then with Gehan, they, they, you know, they started doing a lot of things together. So anyway, having, leaving all the controversies aside, he's done a lot. And as you know, he's written a lot of books as well on, uh, on wildlife. Uh, and also now, in addition to being well known in Sri Lanka, He's also trying to do this in the UK. You may be knowing that he's the chairman of the London Bird Club, a bird association. So which is why he's trying to bring the two together, you know, trying to build Sri Lanka and the, the uh, London, UK. He also had a hand in our Jetwing Biluyana, uh, initial concepts and all of that uh, was, you know, it was all done together. So thank you, Gehan, for all you've done for Jetwing and for Sri Lanka. And this is kind of going to be a series of talks that we would like to uh, live stream. It's, it's something we are trying to experiment today. And if it succeeds, we'll be doing more of them. And I hope you'll all be there. Thank you. Thank you. Switch this off. Thank you, Shiramal. Uh, so Aibo one, and thank you to everybody for braving Central Colombo traffic and coming in here. Are we okay with the sound that mic is switched off? Eh? Okay. Well, it's uh, well as Shirman said, um, I have a long association with. Jetwing, and it's really nice to be back in Jetwing House and uh, meet so many people I know. Uh, but also, you know, Jet, Jetwing is a very collaborative player and works with a number of other hoteliers and tour operators, and that's uh, evidenced by the fact that many other people in the Sri Lankan travel industry are here. So it's really nice to uh, meet you all, all again. Uh, thank you for making the time. I have about 100 slides to get through, so it's about four hours. Is that OK? OK. Well, plan B from the nervous laughter is that I'll, I'll race through uh, some of the slides. Um, so this is actually like three talks rolled into one. So the first part is about what makes Sri Lanka so special. That's something I've uh, you know, written a lot about before. So we can race through some of that. And we'll, we'll get into this thing about London so that hopefully it's something new for you all that London could be branded as a wildlife destination. Yeah, a big, big thank you to uh, some of the key corporate supporters over the year who've helped me with the field work. Uh, there's obviously, um, there's a lot of time and money and uh, and, and you know it's not an easy thing to do the field work, so the, the, the support is very important and something I appreciate. So as I said, I'm going to have this talk in three parts. The first one is a recap to remind people why Sri Lanka is special. 
in the second one, I, I talk, start talking about why London can brand itself as a wildlife destination. And in the last one, I'll just do like a traditional slideshow and, and run you all through uh, various photographs of why, you know, wildlife imagery from the London area. Okay, let's start with Sri Lanka. So, so what I'm saying here is line by line, you can always say, well, Africa has more big game and the, the neotropics, you know, Central America, South America has more biodiversity, um, you know, in, in the developed countries, they have better guides and so on. But there probably isn't a destination that has all of this in one place, in, in a compact, uh, affordable, way, and that is what makes Sri Lanka so special. So now we take blue whales, for example, for granted. But the year before I broke this story, I was speaking to Alistair Fothergill, who did the frozen planet and the blue planet, and a lot of path-breaking blue chip documentary films, often with David Attenborough as the presenter. So the year before I took this image, uh, we were talking at Face Hotel, and he was saying how difficult it was to get images of Baja California. And they used to go out in f river boats for five days and use helicopters. Um, and now, you know, we know how easy it is. Uh, by the way, there are seats in the front. If anybody is finding themselves in an awkward position at the back and wants to come up here, feel free to do so. Uh, then we have the elephant gathering. And, and a lot of these things took a lot of time and effort to brand. So with the blue whale, I remember when I ran this uh, celebrity whale watch with High Magazine and, and Aman Gala, uh, Sri Lal Mittapala, who was the president of the Hotels Association, uh, came along because he said, you know, they've been having hotels in the south for 20, 30 years, and how come nobody had talked about blue whales? So he wanted to come and see if there were blue whales and report back to the Hotels Association. Then Sanjay Gautam Dasa, who, who sits up here, was head of marketing for Jetwing Hotels, and he went for a tourism board subcommittee, and they had discussed this gathering thing that I had been writing about. So they, he came back and told me that they had agreed that they will commission somebody from the zoology department, University of Colombo, to go and see if this gathering actually happens. Because again, there had been hotels in Harborne, and nobody had really talked about it. Well, we know all about the leopards now, but again, uh, there were a lot of doubts. Uh, even within Jet Wing, uh, there were serious doubts of the, the leopard is there and that it can be marketed as a tourism product. So Hiran Kure settled the argument by saying that the once in two month uh, meetings that of all the Jet Wing hotel managers would take place in Yala, and he said, well, Gahan can go and show them leopards and tell us whether there are leopards there or not. And that wasn't that long ago, so this was. Uh, in the year 2000 and 2001. So it just shows that you can have something and not really understand that it's commercially valuable. Uh, and this is what I'm trying to do uh, with London now that I'm there. Okay, so what makes Sri Lanka so super rich? So I, I showed the big animals, with the headline gathering numbers. Um, so I'm not gonna go through all of this in detail because all of this is available on, online, um, there, I have a blog page and there are links to Google folders. You can drag and drop a huge amount of material and you can upload it to your private website or corporate website or whatever. So all the material is there, so I won't go in, uh, in detail. But I have I've broken it down into what I call physical factors, evolutionary factors, and human factors. And there's a big article with somebody uh, 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 which, uh, which, is, which is published in the Sunday Times and Keith Vijay Surya very nicely laid it out as a PDF which brings all of this visually. Um, so there are a number of factors that explain why Sri Lanka is super rich. And even things like birds which we take for granted. So there are you know, other ways of looking at it. So I'm very happy that Perry is here because Perry is one of the pioneers of birding tours. He led the Bowers team um, at the time and Tilo Hoffman was chairman of the Salon Bird Club. So he's run more birding tours than anybody in this country and this is going back maybe 30, 40 years. 
so, so birding tour is not new to Sri Lanka. But what I'm again saying is just look at this differently because there are 10,000 species of birds and they fall into these scientific families and orders. And Sri Lanka is again quite, it's a good place to learn birds because see a third of the families found in the world are found here. And if you look at orders, you know, half of the scientific orders of birds are found here. And some because they migrate. And some of the birds that are familiar in Europe, like the thrushes, in evolutionary terms, they actually evolved in Asia and then they spread out west into Europe. So the Europeans think that they are European birds, like the blackbird and the thrush, which they see in their gardens. But that family actually originated in Central Asia, so which is why Sri Lanka has some of these European birds, because this is where they evolved 40 million years ago. And we know how rich we are for endemic birds. But we are very impressive for reptiles as well. There's 350 species, which is a staggering amount. I mean, Britain has seven species of reptiles. Now, this is, this is something I would like to sort of drive home about before we leave the section on Sri Lanka. So there's this theory called the uh, uh, theory of island biogeography. And it's a very important theory in biology. And it, it Mark the transition of biology from observational science to quantitative science, and it won a Nobel Prize for MacArthur and Wilson. Okay, now one of the things was that it really went back to '93, came to '84, and you know, the last year has not been very good. But that could be due to big oceanic processes. Maybe the krill is forming somewhere else from where the boats are. But it shows that the encounter rates are consistently high. So when you talk to journalists and to operators, this kind of data uh, helps to convince them that you're not just making it up. Another example of uh, citizen science is the orca sightings. Um, so now there are more and more orcas being reported, but it's usually the same pair that are reported over and over again. And the total number of orcas that have been individually identified is 14. Uh, and this is, uh, even in Britain, uh, all the orca sightings relate to just six. There used to be seven until a year ago. Um, so these are uh, fairly long-lived animals forming stable associations. Uh, and a pair that is seen regularly off Sri Lanka was seen in the Arabian Sea off Oman, nearly 2,000 miles away. So that's again coming from this study because we are now collecting photographic records. And this girl, Georgina Jamel, who's English, is studying them and telling us uh, you know, what's going on. So now we're moving this comparison with Britain. So as you would expect, Sri Lanka being a tropical country does have a lot more species than the UK does. And this is just comparing the Sri Lanka in red versus blue in Britain. So for a lot of groups, as you would expect, us being a tropical country, we have so much more. So the red spike is, as you would expect, a lot bigger. But for some groups, Britain does it well. So like the birds uh, and, and even the, the mammals. And the things like plants, I mean, it's not too bad, although you know we look massive here. 4,000 species of plants, you can still see that Britain has about 1,500 species. So, you know, people think that there's no wildlife in Britain, but it's actually quite good. And if you look at the amount of nature reserves Britain has, it's just phenomenal. So in, in Britain, you have this NGO uh, association called the, the Wildlife Trust. So every part of Britain has different wildlife trusts. And they alone, and it's not a government agency, they manage 2,300 nature reserves. And on top of this, you have the state-owned nature reserves. You have the RSPB that has nature reserves. You have the Wildlife and Wetland Trust that has nature reserves. So the, the infrastructure they have is just incredible. And these are 
the nature reserves managed by the Wildlife Trust in the London area. So now we come to uh, the second part of the talk, London and, you know, is it rich for wildlife? So this is very close to where I live. This is a view from the, the Tate Modern's new wing. They have a viewing gallery. So you have the Shard, and you have the River Thames there. And I live about 10 minutes walk from the Shard, uh, not too far from the riverfront. And this is looking across the river into the city. And this is showing the River Thames, which is special because of all the urban rivers in the world, this is the cleanest urban river. There are something like 35 species of fish that are regularly seen. And, and this is part of my uh, walk to work and back. So, so, most, so quite a few of these pictures were taken a few days ago or in the last couple of weeks. So this is a, so you see this thing called Tower Bridge here. And I live about two minutes walk from there. So, uh, you know, I had this fantastic commute where I bird watch on my way to work and on my way back. Uh, and th the river looks very busy, but it's quite clean. And here's evidence that the river is clean. You know, we have the cormorant, uh, which lives exclusively on fish. And it's not in the cormorant because it's rich in fish. You have lots of gulls that come and perch on, on, on the boats. And it's uh, really nice because, because if you're a birder, the gulls are very interesting because they have what are called age groups. Uh, they change their plumage. So the bird on the back, on the left, is an adult. And it takes them four years to get to that. The bird on the right is probably a third year bird. And you can see it's, it still hasn't got the adult plumage. So here's the adult flying. And it's really nice just to you know, watch them fly around. And they come and nest on the city roofs now. Uh, and then you can watch the, the juveniles. And you can see this beautiful mottled plumage they have. Uh, so if you want to get into some technical stuff, uh, the River Thames is a wonderful place. And I probably do more wildlife photography in London than I used to do when I lived in Colombo, because it's so rich. And the jewel in the crown for London is, is the London Wetland Center. It is such an amazing thing. And Shiramal referred to Villuena. So Villuena was actually inspired by this place here. And we thought, well, if London can create a wetland, it must be so much easier to do in Sri Lanka. Well, if you've if you got a lot of money and you've got good engineers like Jude Kastigarachi, who is in the audience today. Uh, it, it was a massive team effort. And we had uh, Sunila Drawalden, who understood what we were trying to do. And the nice thing about the London Wetland Center is so I live near Tower Bridge, but I can use a combination of tube and bus. And in other 15 minutes, I can get to the center. And I can take the bus number 283 from Hammersmith Tube Station. And it takes me into the center. You know, they've made it so accessible that you know, the transport has worked with the nature reserve to bring visitors on public transport right into the reserve. And you can see all the mums and the children and so on. And in summer, they have an outdoor cafe. Uh, and and you know, throughout the year, there's hot food. And it's open 365 days of the year. And, and the visitor facilities are just first rate. And the heights they have are amazing. So this is bottom right is the Vedas Crepe. And here there's an, one of my wildlife heroes, Rohan Petyagoda. Uh, and he's, now this is inside a bird hide. You might think you're in Starbucks or something, right? <laughs> this is a bird watching hide. Okay. Uh, and you can see how there's massive glass windows. And you know, it's almost like you know, you're almost outside. But you're actually inside, because in winter it can be cold. So you need the glass to sort of keep you up. And they have, you know, the glass comes right down if you're on a wheelchair. Okay. And this height, have you lost the thumb? Do you want to adjust it? OK, fine. Um, 
So this is called the Peacock Tower, but it's named after a person. It's three stories high. Um, so you can pack in a hundred bird watchers in there. And this is inside the hide, it's sort of a circular hide. You go around and there are the viewing sites, and that's the view. And how many of you would think of having your wedding reception in a bird watching hide? Well, this is a bird watching hide, and they use this for wedding receptions. In fact, one of Britain's wealthiest men, Zach Goldsmith, um, uh, he had his wedding at the London Wetland Center. Uh, and if the weather is bad, they have it inside. They can have the reception inside the bird watching hide, and it's heated. So it's so that you know they use technology to that degree. Um, so when you think of what Sri Lanka has and how we use it, well, we are using it well. There's a lot of money now from whale watching, birding tours, etc. And I gather Justin Eco Holidays are now having clients out on a 45-day tour. So we've come a long way from. The Jetwing Hotel managers questioning whether we can promote leopards in Sri Lanka to running 45-day wildlife tours. But we, we can still learn a lot from London uh, because in terms of the infrastructure and the facilities, uh, they're just unbeatable. Uh, so th this is a kind of duck called the shoveler, and they come in from mainland Europe during the winter. And sometimes you can see 1% of the wintering population in Britain just from this hide. So they've all gathered around and they're feeding. And this is just a quick mix of the kind of species that you get just in this nature reserve, from sparrowhawks to long-tailed tits to whatever. So Chitra, has a seat here. Okay, and now if you want to come. Okay, so uh, we don't like the crows very much. So the, this is the British answer to the crow. It's a jay. It's in the crow family. But we also have very attractive crows. So this, this bird here, the Ceylon blue magpie, is, is in the crow family as well. So not all of them are dull and black. And uh, the dragonflies are very popular in, in Europe generally. And of course now we're trying to popularize dragonflies in this country as well. And I know a number of tour operators, starting with Jetwing Eco Holidays, has been running dragonfly watching tours for maybe 10 years now. Um, and the London Wetland Center, the way it's built, it's very good for dragonfly photography because you, you've got the, these little wooden bridges open patches of water and you can sort of pan and take the picture. Okay, you might need a sound fix. Okay. Now this this dragonfly is, is quite special because so you have the damsel flies and the true dragonflies. Most dragonflies, they spray their eggs into the water, and the damselflies insert what's called ovipositor under the water and lay their eggs carefully. But this is one of the few dragonflies that actually do that. It's something called emperor dragonfly. Now, why they evolved to do this and not the others, uh, nobody knows. And you have some other interesting dragonfly species like this banded demo cell, so it's a damselfly, and you find them displaying in the same way that you would find birds do, so they have very elaborate wing displays. And, and these are damselflies. And so here's my butterflies and dragonflies book of Sri Lanka, where I'm trying to encourage people to look at these animals as well. A quick overview of the rich flora you have. And, if, and for plant watching, Europe is, is better in some ways because you have these seasons, like in spring, when all the flowers come up together. And, and then 
others sort of, and they die away, and then others come up. So through spring to summer, you have this sort of massive flowering profusion. And with the flowers, of course, you get the butterflies coming. Sorry. So let me just run through uh, two other nature reserves very briefly. So we, I talked about the London Wetland Center, which is to the west. So if, if you think of the London map like that, London Wetland Center is to the west. Then if you go east, you have Raynham Marshes. And if you go north, you have something called rye meads. So normally when people select a home in London, they look at where the schools are. I selected where I live entirely based on where the nature reserves are and in terms of access. I thought if I stay here, I can go west, London Wetland, go north to Rymead, go east to, to Raynham Marshes. I can just walk to the river two minutes away and do my bird watching. And as for the children's education, well, I thought, well, the children had to find a school somewhere. <laughs> you know. um, so uh, Nirma was not involved in the discussion of where we live. <laughs> so this is Raynham Marshes. Uh, so I can, you know, I walk across the bridge where I live, I take the train, and in half an hour, I'm at Raynham Marshes. And from the marshes, you can see the city. So there's a shard and Canary Wharf. And again, you can see how good the visitor infrastructure is. So you have this uh, area where you can have hot food, and you can look out onto the reserve, and it's besides what's known as the Thames Estuary, because the River Thames is a tidal river, so every day the tide comes up and down twice, and as it does, sort of salt water pushes up under Tower Bridge and in, into central London and past central London, and then again it pushes back, and, and offers the fresh water keeps flowing down. And because it's a t tidal river, you, you have these marshlands which are sort of, you know, sometimes a bit like what you see when you go to places like Manor, as the salt water sort of comes in and out. And this strange thing is actually a very uh, eco type of nature reserve. It's very green, very energy efficient. And, and this is sort of looking out and you can see so it's, you know, there are people living there and the marshland in the middle. But it's a magical place and you have things like widgeon, which, you know, which get coming to Mana, uh, and the widgeon come from continental Europe during winter to rain and marshes, and large flocks come, and they actually graze on grass. And these are lapwings, and lapwings are, they are in tens of thousands. They still get, you have still clouds of them rising up into the sky in the 19th century, but due to changes in farming practices, the use of pesticides, and so on, the numbers have fallen. So you now have to go to places like the London Wetland Centre to see lapwings. And if you go to Raynham Marshes, you still see large flocks. And, and it's very nice to be there. Uh, these are the local politicians. Uh, I, th I think they've been studying the Sri Lankan political handbook or something. <laughs> so you can't put three of them together. They start a fight. And then the one on the side is like wondering which side will win. Uh, but coots are wonderful if you're a photographer. Uh, lots of action. This is the other reserve I was mentioning, Rymead, which is an RSPB reserve. So again, I can walk over the bridge and take a train that goes north. And in 35 minutes or so, I'm at this nature reserve. Um, again, they have a, a visitor center, a small one. But again, they have these lakes, they have these sort of fen areas lots of hides, and they do a lot of things to engage the people, like they put these logs so that the insects and other invertebrates come and live under them, and their children can sort of poke and pull and see what is there. So lo a lot of public engagement. And then you have birds like the pochard, and photographically, it's really nice. You get some uh, great opportunities to photograph things. And coots are not the only quarrelsome animals here. Uh, Mohens are uh, quite quarrelsome as well. They're in the same family. So I was in one of the hides when this fight broke out. So two more hens got into a very intense battle. Now the coots and the mohens also fight with each other. Now if you are having a fight, you should never do it 
when your enemy is near and watching you because one more hand was left very tired after the battle. So this coot came along, grabbed it, pulled it under water, and drowned it. So there's nature, red in tooth and claw. These are um, some gadball. It's quite a rare bird in Sri Lanka. But in Europe, it's one of the waterfowl you see regularly. And Raynham marshes and rye meads and the London Wetland Centre are good places for these birds. And at rye meads, because you have these open water with hides, you get these there are chances to get wonderful flight sequences. And they look quite comical the way they're sort of all arranged and, and one is sort of calling out very loudly as if it's in disagreement as to where they're headed. And then as you go through spring into summer, you find the mute swans have their young goslings. So now in this bit, I just want to do like a slideshow, so I'm not going to show any graphs and tables. So it's quarter to seven. They all have been here for 45 minutes. So I'll try and race through that in about 15 minutes. Um, so this is just to give you uh, a, a sense of the, the richness and the photographic richness of what's around London for wildlife. So Rainham Marshes, you know, besides being a tidal uh, estuary, they also have this Finland's sort of park. And this is probably what a lot of Britain would have looked like about 10,000 years ago. Because 120,000 years ago, there was a very big ice age. And a lot of Britain was covered in ice. And the amount of ice was so much that under the weight of the ice, the land got pushed down. And not a few millimeters, there was so much of ice that the land got pushed down a few kilometers. And the water that went into that ice came off the oceans, which, is, which meant the Indian Ocean came down, which meant that Sri Lanka got connected to India as a land bridge. So when Sri Lanka was connected to India, because the oceans had gone down, Britain, the southern Britain started to look like this, and most of the northern bits of Britain were just completely covered in ice sheets. And here, so you get uh, what seems like a pair of lapping flying in tandem. But these are not friends. These are actually two males in combat. It's like something out of Pop Gun. And this shows how maneuverable this bird is. And it, it's beautiful. And just look at the colors, the, the iris and glinting off it. So kingfisher is actually very widespread. This is the common kingfisher. And, and Raynham is very famous. They have an artificial bank on which the kingfishers come and nest. And, and you have the hides, and they put camouflage netting so that can, you can be right up front to them. These are swifts. Um, again, Raynham is really good for photography because it's got these like, big open skies. But I, I, I brought the swifts because there's something interesting I want to bring out, because we see them here as well, and we take it for granted. So let's say there's a swift family, and the baby swift hatches and flies off and starts feeding. How frequently do you think it comes back and has a rest and has a sleep before flying off again? Any guesses? Once a day, twice a day? How often do you think the bird comes back and rests? Now here's the amazing thing. After it flies off, for the next two or three years, it may never land because they live their life on the wing. They sleep on the wing. And they're, while they're sleeping, they're flying. So it's like the dolphins. While they're sleeping, they're moving, and they might even be jumping up and down. So, the swifts, so these guys have just come back from Africa when I photographed them. And they come back, and when they want to sleep, they just go higher up, and they're flying around, and, and they're just doing all this. And they're, and they're asleep. <laughs> and then they come down, and then I'm, and I'm, when the sun is up, and I'm out there with my camera, and then they're feeding. And in two months' time, they'll be on their way to Africa again. 
So they're just amazing birds. This looks like a rat, but it's actually something called a vole, and it's uh, not in the rat family. And um, the vole featured it, uh, as ratty in a famous uh, children's book called Wind in the Willows. So the, the English, uh, well, the British are very fond of, of, of voles. And here's another view just looking along the, uh, the Thames, uh, showing a bit of the geology around the area. Britain is very, very varied in its geology. So back to the London Wetland Centre in Barnes. And bear in mind, this is entirely man-made. Uh, it used to be concrete reservoirs. They spent eight million pounds in, in the 1990s, and they created this. So these pictures you see now were taken last weekend. I, I took a, a British tour operator got in touch with me. They run tours to Sri Lanka as well. So I said, well, I'm, and, and I, I got in a conversation, and I said, why don't you promote uh, wildlife tours in London? I'll, I'll help you guys get set up. So, they, uh, so she and the husband came uh, for a walkabout, and we were in the peacock hide when this little fellow turned up. Uh, he's here illegally because they, they don't like foxes coming here, and they have netting all around the reserve to keep the foxes out. And uh, they also have captive birds that they use in a, in a breeding program. Um, and obviously, foxes being foxes, he was very keen on some of the gray herons that were there. Um, but the gray herons f flew away. The nice thing from the the height is because it's so high up, if you go to the top level, you, you start getting these sort of aerial views of birds. So uh, this, this kind of flight shot, you know, wouldn't be possible if the bird was flying over you. Um, and while we were there, there were two of these emperor dragonfly females laying their eggs as well. So this is all sort of, you know, all just w during one quick session. It just shows how rich and varied it can be. But I also want to show some of the flowers because, you know, we, we think of the tropics as being very botanically rich uh, and exciting, and it is. But as I said, for flowers, uh, s very seasonal countries like in Europe uh, or any, anywhere where it's temperate or where the latitude is either sort of northerly or southerly is very good because the flowering has to get packed into a compressed season. Um, and, and in spring and summer, any of these nature reserves are wonderful. They have carpets of these, you know, things like birds for trefoil. And then you have butterflies like this gatekeeper on this Oxford ragwort, which is actually introduced with just cape. And, you know, lots of woodland birds like the long-tailed tit. And then you find the dragonflies are out the large red dragon uh, damselfly, and, and the bees and the bumblebees. Now, the bumblebees are quite interesting. So there are some bumblebees called cuckoo bumblebees. So what the female does is it flies around, um, and there's a poster where you have snacks where uh, Keith Vijayasura has laid out this 10 bumblebees of London, and it has pictures of cuckoo bumblebees. So it flies around, finds the nest of another bumblebee, it kills that female. Now, it's got to avoid a worker's revolt because now it's killed their queen. So it then exudes pheromones to chemically tell the workers that she is the legitimate queen. So she now gets the workers to work for her and lays her eggs. And, and these workers end up bringing up her babies. And you know her job is done. So it's just amazing. So it's not just the, in the bird cuckoo. So you find this uh, cuckolding uh, takes place in, in lots of other animal groups as well. And in plants and, uh, and their pollinators, things like the bees and bumblebees have very closely evolved. Now, there's a burnet moth. So during sort of even up to now, you find a lot of these things are in flower and the butterflies and the bees and the bumblebees, they are all over. And here's a little test. Now, do you see a little pattern emerging in these flowers? Focus on the color. Okay. 
It says purple loose strife. That'll give you a hint. And these are orchids. Do you notice that a lot of these flowers, the color is purple? Well, that's because the pollinators, the bumblebees and, and bees and a lot of other insects, they see in ultraviolet light. So these purple flowers are very good at, trans, at transmitting in UV. So it's the field scabious. So you find that, uh, so they've done experimental tests with bumblebees and you have different colored flowers with different things. And, and you find that they show a preference. And if you look at this in UV, it's like a aircraft landing pad with the lines sort of telling the bee where to go to, you know, where exactly to land. Um, so certain colors like yellow and purple seem very effective. And some like this flowering rush use a mixture. And of course, some flowers do have uh, you know, some flowers are white. So as we come to the end of spring and summer, you find those little goslings I showed you, the cygnets, the swans have sort of grown up um, and they're becoming independent. So this is sort of towards the tail end of summer and these are some black-headed girls. And if you've ever seen these paintings in churches of the angels with the wings, just look at those wings. It's just, you know, maybe those medieval Italian painters had been watching gulls and got the angel wings. Maybe they had high-speed photography we didn't know about. And you get some very interesting behavior as well when you're in the height. So here we can see two black-headed gulls doing, you know, a very famous uh, sort of courtship posture. So, you know, you don't have to just tune on the TV and watch BBC Wildlife to see this kind of thing. You know, just move into London. And here you have common terms. I mean, again, you know, you, you see these wildlife documentaries where you see this kind of behavior. And the amazing thing is that, you know, you could be a Londoner and all of this is, is right there in London, easily accessible by public transport. And if you wait long enough in a hide, you can have some in very interesting behavior. So here's some aggressive behavior. There's a common terms, and the, and the black-headed girls, they both want the same patch of shingle, and they are not very good neighbors. So occasionally, they have a go at each other. And you get the reptiles coming out. So this is the common lizard. But Britain is very poor. As I said, there are only something like seven species of reptiles, because I, I suppose it's, it's too cold during most of the year for reptiles to survive, except, of course, the reptiles that I've been showing you, because although we think of birds as one group and the reptiles as another group, birds are reptiles. But they branched off tens of millions of years ago, and the dinosaurs that you see in all these children's toys, those dinosaurs actually had feathers. And it's only now that science is beginning to realize that T-Rex and most of these dinosaurs had some degree of feathering. And as we come into autumn, you know, the leaves turn. And then you find things like the hawthorn are in fruit. And this is very important for the birds like the thrushes, which travel uh, for the field. Um, so they can, uh, lot, they can fatten up. Um, and, and for the ones who are staying over especially because they need uh, food to keep them going through the cold months. Because most of the migrants have left by this time. Um, and this is to keep them tidy. Uh, and the mammals also collect and get ready for the winter. So here, gray squirrel. Uh, it's not a native mammal. Um, it, it was introduced from North America and as you know, the Americans have a habit of taking over things. So uh, gray schools have overrun the UK. So th that's it. i sort of try to keep it to, uh, to 50 minutes or so. Um, I suppose we can take questions.
think so. How, how, many, how many people here were surprised at how rich London is for wildlife? Okay, a few, quite a show of hands. Good, so I think I've succeeded then in dispelling the notion that it's just concrete and glass. Okay, so, so the question was, what is the best particular time to visit London? So if, if you want, uh, obviously, things like the flowers in bloom, then the, the
So the management through as of a few weeks ago was to uh, have access to anybody who becomes a member of the London Natural History Society. The London Bird Club is a part of the NHS. So now if anybody sends me an email um, with an email from the treasurer confirming that they're a member, I can give them a, a, a key code so that they can access one of the reservoirs and we're going to roll this out to some of the other reservoirs. So this is again to give bird watchers access. Another project they're doing is they're building a, a, a recording portal so that people can submit their records online and it will then go into the uh, various sort of national uh, statistical agencies that collect ornithological data. Um, so this is again citizen science and citizen science is very, very important in the UK. So when they do something like a bird atlas, you find tens of thousands of you know, ordinary people who are bird watchers have submitted their records. Um, and, and then we produce these distribution atlases. Another project I'm involved in, and uh, I think some of the people in tourism have already uh, heard from me about this, and because this is an opportunity for Sri Lanka to advertise, the London Bird Club is doing something called the London Bird Atlas. Now these publications only come out every two years or so. So it's going to be an expensive book. It's a, you know, hard cover, about 40 pounds, 352 pages. Uh, and, and that book will be the standard reference work for the next 20 years plus. The, the LNHS have been reluctant to take advertising. Uh, they've been around since 1858. Uh, they've been around for, you know, like 150 years or something. Um, but they've been a very science and conservation society. So the, as chairman of the London Bird Club, I'm on the LNHS Council. Um, and w one of the discussions we've had is to invite advertising because it makes sense to bring down the, the cost of funding the book. And also the bird watchers are interested in foreign holidays. Uh, most London Bird Club members take two to three holidays a year. So they have said, you know, people who want to advertise for a thousand pounds can take a full page, but it's going to be there for, you know, 20 years. So it's a scientific project, um, but it has very important implications of conservation because the national policy makers look at the atlas, they look at how the distributions have changed, and then they say, what has driven the change? Is it agricultural practices which are harmful to birds or what, okay? But this kind of atlas, so while it has the scientific side, it's also for the bird, birders who want to know what birds are found in London and they want their reference book. Uh, so that's a very interesting project. It's got all these elements, you know, part of citizen science, it's got conservation, it's got science, um, and now um, perhaps because of my involvement, it, it means that the Sri Lankan travel industry can reach that very affluent circle of London birders by advertising their lodges or through operations here. Okay. Does anybody else have any other questions? Okay. Um, let me ask Parmi or Madhushan what is happening next. Do you want to take the mic? Okay, so um, th there are refreshments in the, if you go out and turn right, there's a room. Um, so please do go along and have something to eat and have a drink. And uh, thank you very much again for coming. And I hope I've uh, shown you London in a different way. Thanks again.